Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll go ahead and begin. I'm James Horace. I'm from the section of gastroenterology and the program director. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Condal Kynum. Um, there is a saying that says that home is where your feet may leave, but not your heart. And so it's a pleasure for me to, re to bring Dr. Kynum back home to us. Dr. Kynum is a Professor, assistant Professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he is the Director of Endoscopy and completed his residency in internal medicine here at LSU Health and followed by Chief Resident. And then he stayed with us and completed a gastroenterology fellowship before going to the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville where he did an advanced endoscopy um, subspecialty fellowship and has been at the University of Alabama since 2012 or 13. 12, 13. Um, where he uh, is doing the advanced and frontiers in endoscopy. And it's my pleasure to ask him to come to the podium to give us a little bit more information about um, his work. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, James. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, this is the place that made me a, the physician I am today, and it's uh, an amazing experience to walk through the same halls and the wards and the endoscopy unit. Um, uh, the mentors that I had here in medicine and gastroenterology, uh, my co-residents, uh, two of whom are here today, uh, that's an amazing experience to have a chance to come back here and talk about a few things uh, that I'm interested in and I've uh, kind of uh, brought to uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, which is kind of my second home now. Um, and uh, I really look forward to uh, uh, presenting uh, this talk today and to kind of uh, see what questions or thoughts you have about it. Uh, I tried to flavor it a little differently from a traditional talk on endoscopy and I know uh, that most of you are obviously not gastroenterologists and um, while most indications for endoscopy procedures are pretty straightforward, there are some situations that you may not think endoscopy has a role. And <clears throat> that's what I wanted to change a little bit today uh, to try to see uh, if I can explain to you uh, what, what things we can do with an endoscope now that we couldn't do uh, even a few years ago. I uh, have a single conflict of interest. I am on a, I'm a grant recipient with Olympus, and I'm also a PI on one of their studies. Uh, so the objective really is to talk about uh, some procedures. I'll tell you right now that uh, no amount of time is enough to talk about every single innovation in endoscopy. So I had to kind of pick and choose, and I hope these are the ones that are the most useful to you guys. Um, the big one for me, I'm an I'm a, um, endosonographer, and that's my first love. Uh, which is using endoscopic and ultrasound to do different things. And so that's the main focus of what my talk is going to be. But I also want to talk a little bit about, not only about what uh, new things we can do with an endoscopic ultrasound, but also something called third space endoscopy, which is a concept uh, uh, maybe some gastroenterologists are familiar with, but really most internists and other uh, internal medicine subspecialists and surgeons are, are not so aware of. <clears throat> Uh, so we'll talk about the current state of knowledge, uh, comparison to current care, outcomes, uses, what the limitations are, and how we select patients. Uh, so the first thing uh, that, that I got me interested in an unusual path to advanced endoscopy was EUS-guided uh, drainage of the bile duct. You know, traditionally we do this with an ERCP scope, right? We go up to the ampulla, we get into it, do different things, shoot, die, and, and try to understand it better. But the many times that you can't get in through the ampulla, uh, into the bile ducts or the pancreatic duct, and then what do you do? We call IR and try to do what's called a percutaneous drainage. But I'll be honest with you, our IR colleagues are very good at it, and they've really made this a very good test. But it still has a certain amount of morbidity and even mortality associated with it that we can't really take away. Even in the best hands, the numbers are in the teens. 
So, you can have abdominal wall infections, you can have bile leaks, you can have uh, bleeding, you can have pain uh, and, and think about the kind of patient who gets this. Uh, it's usually someone with cancer obstructing the bile duct, so they're not in really good shape to face these difficulties. So, EUS guided meaning you're in the, in the stomach or the duodenum and then you're using your access to the bile ducts and the liver or the or the main bile duct to try to accomplish the same thing internally. And honestly, it's more physiologic too. Your bile is not coming out, it's going into your stomach or your duodenum. Um, so, the main reasons we do this is when you can't do an ERCP or you can get to the ampulla and it's obviously obstructed or you can't get to the ampulla, the, the duodenum is obstructed. <clears throat> so, these are the two approaches you would take. So, this is when the scope is in the stomach, you're able to look at the liver with the ultrasound and this is the left bile duct and that's how uh, you access the bile, uh, biliary tree. And the second is this is in the bulb of the duodenum and this is the main bile duct and you're able to access it here. So, these are the two places you can get into it. So, really the best way I think if you have a distal obstruction like a big ampullary cancer or a pancreas cancer blocking uh, the bile duct uh, and you can't get in, the best way to really do it is through the bulb. Remember that your duodenum is hugging your bile duct and there's multiple points at which you can access it um, and that is always preferred to access the bile duct through the bulb of the duodenum. You can sometimes access it through the stomach too, but it's a little more challenging. Um, now, what are the things to remember uh, about this procedure? I mean, you're actually uh, not going in a, in a purely physiologic way. You're placing a stent through the, the bulb of the duodenum into the mid bile duct. Now, if some tumor uh, that's in the pancreas is resectable, then you have to think about that. Is this going to widen the operative field? Is it going to make surgery more difficult? Is it going to make uh, the tumor uh, more difficult for them to remove, assuming we get it to resectability? So, those are things to think about uh, before you jump and do this. So, the easiest indication or the simplest indication for this is uh, in a metastatic uh, patient or a patient who has uh, a cancer that cannot be resected. Uh, so, there has been multiple large studies and, and really uh, it is a very, very comparable safety profile with almost obviously no pancreatitis risk. So, when you do a EUS guided biliary drainage, you are not touching the pancreas. So, you are taking away one of the most feared complications of ERCP from the picture. Um, the, the comparison as you can see here, you know every, every single uh, 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 parameter is better with uh, EUS guided biliary drainage, fewer post procedure events, lower risk of going back in to try to do something, no difference in hospital stay. Um, so, this is important, but what the caveat to remember is that this has to be something that someone is trained in, has to have the cognitive and the procedural ability and technique to be able to do it. Uh, so, that is the big thing. So, I am going to skip a couple of videos and get to the main one here. Can we get the lights down a little bit? Do not try to uh, analyze this video too much, it can, it can overwhelm you, but I will just walk you through it. So, I am in the bulb of the duodenum and that big black structure you are seeing is the bile duct right there, big and wide obviously obstructed distally, that is the portal vein right there. Um, and uh, so, you are always want to interrogate the whole area. So, the first thing you are deciding is and that is the gastroduodenal artery. So, as you can see you got some pretty uh, uh, big vascular structures here, uh, but I have chosen a spot you know I make sure that there is an area where I can avoid the artery and that the bile duct is big enough for my, for my uh, stent. And then we now we're going to try to place the stent here. Um, so that is the deploying mechanism. I've penetrated with some heat. I'm about to deploy one part of the stent in the bile duct. You can't see that part really well. This is how the endoscopic view is right here, and that is that is a dumbbell of the stent inside the bile duct. And now, I am going to deploy the other dumbbell, dumbbell in the bulb. As you can see, there is some bleeding here, looks arterial, but this stent expands and a tamponades any arteries that are in the way. Uh, so, you are able to really control any potential bleeding. 
So, what are the potential pitfalls of this? Um, <coughs> there is a risk of uh, uh, not facing the stent appropriately. As you can see, you are fully intraperitoneal. So, if you fail in placing the stent, then you created a hole in the bile duct or in the duodenum and it is a peritoneal hole. So, you have to be very cognizant of that. Um, uh, you can injure uh, other structures that you may not be able to see well, like the GDA and the portal vein are obvious, but there is multiple other structures. Sometimes you can have a very large cystic duct that can mimic the bile duct and you have actually put the stent in the cystic duct. Uh, vascular injury, so as you can see the portal vein was on the other side. If I push too hard, I could easily cause a significant portal vein injury. So, that is something important. And if the stent does not reply appropriately, the bile can then leak into the peritoneum. So, you have created a bile leak, uh, subsequent bile peritonitis. So, you have to have the skills not just to place the stent, but also to rescue if you have had a, a bad outcome or you have not placed it well. Um, so, now coming to the second approach is if you have a, a bile duct problem or an obstruction in the middle of the duct or in the higher, uh, higher area. Uh, then obviously, this is not going to work uh, because you are distal to that obstruction. Uh, so, then you do what is called a hepaticogastrostomy. So, your endoscopic ultrasound is in the stomach, you are looking at the liver and you are accessing the, the left side of the bile duct system through the stomach, across the peritoneum and through the liver. Now, obviously, this is much more challenging. Uh, so, you have to be much more careful. You are fully intraperitoneal. And uh, this is how, this is the ultrasound scope, this is how you access it. Uh, and sometimes you are able to get across completely, then you can switch to an ERCP scope or you can do all the therapy through the ultrasound scope. So, what are the challenges here? This is not truly completely intraperitoneal, meaning you are in the free anterior abdomen. So, you have to be very careful about what tools you pu push through. Um, you are very close to the GE junction, you do not you don't want to go through the esophagus. Uh, obviously, there is a distance between the scope and your bile duct, so you have to go through liver. What are you going to do to that liver parenchyma? How are you going to pass your instruments in? Are you going to dilate it, burn it, cauterize it? So, those are all technical issues that are very serious. And uh, the liver being an intraperitoneal organ is going to move constantly with respiration when you are doing your procedure. So, these are some challenges. Uh, there have been case reports of the stent being pulled into the, into the peritoneum because of uh, movement. So, you have to put very long stents to prevent that. So, these are in my mind truly palliative procedures in a patient who can't get anything, uh, uh, but needs his bile duct drain because he has cholangitis. Uh, those are the specific situations I would reserve this for. Uh, so, the next uh, procedure I want to talk about is gallbladder drainage. Now, we have a lot of situations where, you know, we have a person with abnormal LFTs, they have acute cholecystitis, maybe calculus in the bile duct is suspected and they call us for an ERCP and sometimes there is not any problem with the bile duct and the problem is only with the gallbladder. What can you do for these patients? Obviously, they tend to be a, a sicker subset of patients. Um, so, you can have primary acute cholecystitis, which is their presentation to the hospital. Those guys tend to do a little better. You get surgery on board, you clear the bile duct and they get surgery, uh, either very early or delayed. But then you have the subset of critically ill ICU patients who are ill for something else and get stressed cholecystitis, also have stones maybe sometimes. And these guys can get really unwell and they are really not suitable for gallbladder intervention. You can't go remove uh, their gallbladder in the OR. They are too sick for that. Uh, IR is an option. So, they can do what is called a cholecystostomy. Uh, that is also not something that is easily done at bedside. Some centers do it. It is usually something where they have to transport them to an IR suite. So, these are all issues. Uh, so, these kinds of patients, you can actually do uh, endosonographic drainage. In the same way that I access the bile duct, you move your scope around and you have a big unwell gallbladder, you can uh, you drain it in the exact same way that I showed you the video of the bile duct using a stent uh, that you then advance into the gallbladder using cautery uh, and are able to place a stent. Now, there are issues with this you have to be thoughtful about, right? I mean, you have uh, now attached the gallbladder to the stomach, so subsequent surgery might be a problem. 
uh, uh, what happens to the stem. These are not designed to stain uh, indefinitely and when you remove it that hole closes and they get sick again. So, you do want to think about the long term and the end points for the patient before you do something like this. Uh, there have also been situations where you can actually go through these big stents and do therapy on the stones by doing lithotripsy and, and such. So, you are able to get rid of the stones. Uh, this is a pretty much a large case series and anecdotal evidence. There is no big data. There are some trials going on. Uh, hopefully, we are going to be part of our center is going to be part of that randomized trial comparing uh, IR guided drainage to uh, EUS. Uh, but really, it is very, very comparable to percutaneous drainage uh, with a, a significantly lesser number of complications. Uh, I think that is important to remember. Uh, both delayed and long term complications, including pain, bile leak, uh, drain site infections, and such. I am skipping over some of the videos because uh, the talk is unfortunately pretty long and I want to get some, some data in. Uh, so, now uh, when, when we started doing these kind of almost third space transperitoneal interventions, we realized that you could actually uh, do a surgical bypass. So, using the same stent and sometimes a bigger stent, so there is a 15 millimeter stent and then now we have a 20 millimeter stent, you can actually create a gastrojejunostomy from the stomach. Uh, in patients who cannot get uh, surgery for whatever reason. They have an unresectable pancreas cancer, they may have a metastatic disease, they are not operative candidates uh, or they have significant ascites uh, or other comorbidities and the surgeons think this guy uh, or the patient is going to basically die if they go to the OR. Um, so, those are candidates for this, but of course, that same subset of patients if, if something goes wrong when you do the procedure uh, are also in the same situation. Uh, so, that is something to think about carefully, but we are able to now do this. We have done quite a few, uh, probably about 10 uh, so far at our center. None of them have had any complications, uh, but you do want to have your surgeons on board uh, because if you are not able to successfully place the stent, then you have created a, a hole in the stomach and in the jejunum. So, this is the principle of it. Uh, so, you have the ultrasound. We know that the C loop kind of goes and then the first part of the jejunum and the fourth portion uh, tuck up against the <coughs> greater curve. So, you park your scope here, you fill the stomach with water and you fill the jejunum with water, give them a bunch of glucagon and levsin to decrease and stop all motility uh, and then basically you use a cautery assisted device to kind of make a hole through the stomach, enter the jejunum and this is the end result of it. Uh, and this is how it looks endoscopically. So, these are called lumen opposing stents, meaning they have two dumbbells that hold uh, pull together. So, they hopefully hold the anastomosis in place. Um, the data is very, very promising. Um, the su technical success rate is extremely high in the high 80s to 90s. Uh, clinical success rate is also significant, meaning uh, they were able to eat right away. They start on liquids the first day and uh, soft food the next day. Uh, so, this is a unique procedure. Obviously, here the patient selection is very important. A multidisciplinary approach is very important. You want to get your surgeons on board. You want to make sure that they understand what you are doing. Also, that they understand that they may have to go back to the OR. If I can't, if I have started to put the stent and can't finish it, then, then that is a surgical problem. Uh, so, what I am really excited about is that this has actually been reproduced in benign for benign indications too. Uh, so, the, the benign indication would be chronic peptic ulcer disease or duodenal bulb ulcer disease and stenosis with recurrent admissions for gastric outlet obstruction. The other subset of patients is chronic pancreatitis patients with mass forming chronic pancreatitis in the head causing obstruction um, and either surgical therapy has failed or they are not candidates for surgery. And we have had a series of patients uh, described by this big group of 26 patients. I think we have had probably four patients, uh, all of whom have had successful uh, uh, endosonographic gastrojejunostomies. So, I am really excited about that. Uh, and the, the success rate is very high, and the duration of the therapy is also high. In fact, we now have a cohort of patients in whom we have removed the metal stent and we see what happens to the hole. Uh, when you have had it in for at least 6 months to a year, 
we find that that persists, that hole actually stays open. Uh, we're not sure what the predictors of that are, but uh, a few of them do close off. So, it, the problem repeats. <coughs> So, this is the last one about uh, the axial stent and how we can access things. Now, we have a whole hu huge cohort of patients who have all gotten bypass surgeries or for obesity and you know accessing their bile duct and duodenum and ampulla or their, their excluded stomach is a huge challenge. So, we do what is called the edge procedure where you use the EUS to place a large stent across the, from the pouch into the excluded stomach. And then you have a normal physiologic access to the stomach. You can do therapy to any like potentially bleeding ulcer in there. And you can also get to the ampulla and do ERCP therapy. In the past, you would have to do a very elaborate deep bowel endoscopy and try to get to the ampulla through the long way with a deep E scope, try to use different tools to get into the bile duct. This is a huge challenge and needs specific training. So we're able to bypass that process. Uh, by, by using this technique. So, uh, changing the flavor a little bit, uh, what can we do through EUS that is actual treatment of lesions? Uh, so, there has been a significant advance in this. We have treated pancreatic cysts, uh, which are mucinous neoplasms most commonly, uh, because they have a small proportion of these have a potential to become pancreatic cancer. Uh, we have also treated tumors. Uh, particularly insulinomas in non-operative candidates. Uh, I, have, uh, I, I have a cohort of patients uh, who routinely come to me. I, I, I inject uh, absolute alcohol using a ultrasound guidance and a needle and ablate these insulinomas and they do fine for some time and then the insulinoma comes back and we do this. In some situations, we are really successful in ablating it and they go for a long time without any uh, insulin uh, excess secretion. Uh, a, a new modality is RFA, which is radio frequency ablation. They were able to get the technology small enough that it can stick at the tip of an endos, uh, EUS FNA needle. And then I can then find the tumor and exactly direct my therapy to the tumor to try to uh, destroy it. Now, right now, our focus is on controlling symptoms and to decrease tumor burden. Uh, we are not sure that this has significant survival advantage. Obviously, that requires very rigorous randomized control trials to do that. We are actually in the process of uh, doing one, a multicenter trial, where we are going to do standard of care for pancreas cancer and standard of care plus EUS guided RFA therapy, uh, sham versus RFA, uh, to try to see if we make any dent in symptoms. But also, we are also looking for the holy grail or difference in survival. Uh, and the other big thing we are also looking for is are we going to be able to get them to resectability uh, better with an RFA probe or not. So, these are all uh, things in the future. Uh, so, we also use a lot of ablative agents like I was talking about alcohol. You can also use uh, gemcitabine and paclitaxel. Uh, we instill these into the pancreatic cysts and we see that there is uh, essentially destruction of the cyst. Uh, as you can see, there are some uh, talked about the insulinoma, a significant improvement in symptoms and control. Uh, there have been a few anecdotal cases of almost complete remission, meaning that the insulin levels have not gone up after we treated them. Uh, this is a significant tumor size reduction and decrease in CA19 level uh, and some improvement in symptoms. Now, the whole, like I said, the most important thing though, if you want to make a game changing treatment, is to really figure out if you are making a dent in survival. As you know, pancreas cancer, all comers, survival is at 3 percent at 5 years, which is pathetic. Uh, so, that is the holy grail of our uh, research. So, this is how the, the probe looks. This is the RFA tip. And you can actually, based on the volume of the tumor, uh, choose different sized uh, RFA probes, different thickness and different energy levels. So, coming to hepatology, what can we do with advanced endoscopy and endoscopy in terms of hepatology? I mean, we, we think of banding, right? That is about it. Uh, but there is so much more we can do now with uh, ultrasound scope. Um, so, this is like a, a one stop shop. You can do a EGD, look for viruses, do an EUS, get a liver biopsy, 
uh, treat any esophageal viruses which have EGD, treat gastric viruses which are EUS uh, endoscope uh, and uh, do a lot many more things. One of the big things that has now become an EUS uh, type procedure is liver biopsy. In the past, we would almost always do them percutaneously from the side, but now liver biopsy through EUS has been widely accepted, uh, very safe, much safer than a percutaneous route. You don't have to worry about the pleura, the rib, the abdominal wall, uh, making the patient lay on their right side for three hours, uh, none of that. Uh, obviously, what are the advantages with the EUS? I can look at exactly where I'm going. I know how to avoid vessels, I know which vessel uh, is in the way, which bile duct is in the way. I can also obtain samples from multiple different areas. As you know, with uh, percutaneous biopsy, one shot, you go and you come out. Here, I can get the right lobe, left lobe, caudate, whatever I want, because we know that uh, liver disease distribution can be patchy in your liver. Uh, and this can be done very easily like a, a procedure. I've done them under moderate sedation in the endoscopy suite. Uh, we can use CRNAs if we need to. Uh, there's almost no pain, no uh, post-procedure things to follow. The rate of hemorrhage from this biopsy is extremely low. Um, so this is uh, something that's become kind of almost close to standard of care in our uh, hospital. Uh, the only uh, exception would be patients with significant thrombocytopenia or uh, high INR. Uh, if they're more than two, we ask the IR guys to do it because they're able to go through intravascularly, and that's the big advantage. <clears throat> uh, so what can we do with EUS that's therapeutic? You know, with an EGD regular scope, you ban viruses. But with EUS scope, you can also treat gastric viruses and even large gastric viruses, which were always a challenge in the past. Uh, we can also use EUS-guided tools to actually uh, diagnose uh, portal pressure gradients, figure out what the pressures are uh, without having to subject them to a transjugular procedure. And hopefully that will allow us to uh, predict the, the risk of portal hypertension. Um, so the EUS-guided glue and coil therapy. I'll talk a little bit about this. One of the things, challenges in endoscopy has always been a gastric viruses. How do we treat these? Uh, how do we uh, get them controlled when they're emergently bleeding? You know, TIPS has always been one of the backups for this procedure, but that's not easily done. You have to take them to the IR suite, and sometimes the patient is too unstable. Um, so, you know, glue therapy through an endoscope has been documented in the past, has been fairly successful, but EUS adds a layer of uh, extra therapeutic options to that. One of the problems with glue injection is you can inject all the glue you want, but the problem is that there's a risk of embolization. Once the volume of glue injected goes above 3 ml, this can embolize anywhere. You can go to the lungs, to your brain. Uh, there have been descriptions of stroke and the massive pulmonary embolus related to glue injections. So we all, we're always looking at ways to minimize glue injection, and this is where uh, EUS comes through. The other advantage of EUS is if you've had massive lumen obscuring bleeding, I can still see through the ultrasound. Uh, I don't have to see the endoscopy. If I can get myself to the distal esophagus, I'm able to look at the fundus, the gastric varices, I'm able to look at flow with Doppler, I'm able to target the feeding vessel. So that's the, the other advantage. So we have uh, multiple large series, but this is probably the largest was done in California. Uh, so they were uh, actually um, had 5% of their patients out of 152 were actively bleeding, meaning they had massive hemorrhage, nothing could be seen. And uh, this is where they did EUS-guided transesophageal treatment of gastric viruses, like I was talking about. A very, very high success rate, um, both acutely for the ac acute bleeders, but also chronically in successfully ablating the gastric viruses, uh, close to 90 plus percent obliteration. Um, and there were no uh, embolic events when they used both the combination of glue and coil and no deaths. So let me talk about what that is. So this is a, a gastric varix, as you can see. This is the same gastric varix through the ultrasound. Um, now you see here there's a little round circle there. That's a coil. So I take, when I identify the feeding vessel, I determine the size of that vessel and I decide on which coil I want to use. And I'm able to place this IR coil through my 
and uh, EUS needle it directly into the feeding vessel. Now, what does this coil do? It is a thrombogenic agent, it allows clotting of blood, but it also acts as a framework for the glue. So, then I chase that with the glue injection and you obliterate the vessels like this. As you can see the endoscopic picture here, uh, complete obliteration in a, in a few months. The advantage of the coil is that it forms a framework and allows you to use much lesser amount of glue uh, than you otherwise would. And this has kind of been a game changer in the treatment of gastric varices uh, using the endoscope. Um, we can also, like I said, use, do a lot of diagnosis. We now have a probe that can actually act as a manometer. So it's an EUS uh, needle guided probe. You identify the blood vessel, place your probe in it, and you attach a little uh, device to the other end of it, and it tells you the pressures uh, in, the, uh, in the vessel. So here uh, uh, you can see the portal vein, um, and you saw the portal vein in the other video I showed you very easily seen, and this is the device. So you're able to access all these vascular structures to measure pressures, and you can also do it segmentally uh, if you need to know what the portal pressure gradient is. Uh, so this is new technology. So coming, moving away from EUS, coming to third space endoscopy, which is a word I'm sure some of you would have heard about. Basically, third space endoscopy is using the bowel wall as an access um, point, not only to remove lesions that are in the wall, but also across the wall in whatever cavity you're in. So, be it the mediastinum, the peritoneum, uh, the pelvic area, and such. And the point is that you can use the gastric or the, the bowel wall as a natural uh, closure device where you're able to do different things and you stagger the entry points so that the wall heals itself and you don't have to worry about doing surgery anymore. So this graphic will kind of explain that to you. So you, assuming this is the bowel wall, this is the muscularis propria, which is the muscle layer, and this is the mucosa. So you inject fluid and then you work your way with cautery into that space and this space, the submucosa, is very, very easily expanded by injecting uh, fluid or dye. So the dye helps mark the area and the fluid expands it. And then once you expand it, you have a whole space here that you can, for example, if there's a cancer here, you can remove it. Uh, if there's a lesion here, you can make an entry point here and remove that. And then this is what I meant by a staggered closure. Because you made a tunnel, this hole, gets healed and you have a, a distance to travel. So this whole area, which is a potential space you created, kind of falls on itself and heals. So this is how you are able to access, quote unquote, the third space. Um, so we won't go into the details of it, but the most common ones are what we call POEM, which is per oral endoscopic myotomy. It is used for treating echolasia. Um, and then also used for treating gastroparesis, uh, which are two very common but difficult conditions to treat. Um, we also do, uh, we're able to treat Zenkers endoscopically with this. We have a series of almost uh, 20 patients of Zenkers that I've done, and we've just started our POEM program at uh, UAB. So I'm going to focus on the two most common uh, ways we do third space. One is a, a POEM which is uh, basically you're entering the wall of the esophagus <clears throat> in between the muscle layer and the mucosa. You create a tunnel and then you expand the space right up until the stomach uh, and you enter the cardia and you expand the space, expose the muscle layer uh, in the form of a tunnel. And then you go ahead and cut the circular muscle fibers all the way from the cardia uh, to about 8 to 10 centimeters proximally. And that is basically what you're doing is a heller myotomy, except that you're doing it endoscopically. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, we have a little video here, uh, which is self-explanatory, but I'll walk you through it too. So this is what I mean. When they make that incision, they inject that fluid, which is the blue dye, into the submucosal space. Once they expand it, they make an opening. And this is the only opening they make. And now they make a tunnel. So that blue space is where you want to go. 
So, they are entering what we call the submucosal space. You keep expanding it by injecting that blue fluid and up top here those, those white fibers are the circular muscle layer. So, you create and expand this potential space uh, until you reach the cardia. Uh, obviously, when you do this, you will come across blood vessels and you really actually want to stay away from the mucosa because that forms the flap that closes this hole. So, it is very important to keep the mucosa intact. So, now you are coming back and you have exposed the muscle layer and that is the tunnel. So, that is in the lumen, the true lumen right now. So, now they are going to cut the muscle fiber. So, you are cutting the circular muscle fiber and you will see the longitudinal muscle fiber exposed. And you take this incision all the way to the bottom of the circular muscle layer right into the cardia. You know the decalasia extends three, about 3 centimeters into the distal esophagus and then about 2 centimeters further. And then you have done the myotomy. So, you come back through the tunnel and you just close the little opening that you have made to make the tunnel with some clips. So, that is that little hole. And remember this is staggered. So, the myotomy is distal to where this hole is. And then you close it with the clips. And you are done. And you are able to see here that the G junction is completely widely patent. It does not look like echolasia. There is no tension. Uh, it is freely mobile. And you are able to go through it. So, this is a very uh, interesting endoscopic procedure that essentially replaces uh, Heller. Um, obviously, uh, there are caveats to it. There are patients who have had failed Hellers. There are patients who have failed Botox injections. Uh, which leads to a lot of scarring and such. So, you have to have, uh, it is important to select patients. But really, we have come such a long way with the POEM procedure now that uh, most large, big academic centers, POEM is the first go to procedure for echolasia. Now, what are the disadvantages of POEM? Um, well, this is a busy slide. So, I will not talk about the slide. You can look at it. Uh, basically, you know, when you do a Heller myotomy, you are combining it with a fundoplication. So, you are addressing the risk of creating intractable gastroesophageal reflux disease. Obviously, when you do a poem, you are not doing that. But in the future, we are now able to do uh, an endoscopic Neeson uh, or a fundoplication using a device called the esophix device. I am not going to go over that today. So, you do the poem and then you go with this device and then you create a fundoplication at the same time. Uh, so, that is the future of poem. But right now, we do have uh, uh, almost a 25 to 30 percent uh, severe gastroesophageal reflux as an outcome after successful poem surgery. So, dis their dysphagia is better, but they have uh, significant reflux. So, you have to treat that. <clears throat> uh, and also, the other important thing is the durability of the outcome. This is uh, one of the largest series uh, from the center that has done this the earliest. And as you can see, they have a close to 90 percent uh, persistent response rate. Now, they did lose a few patients to follow up, uh, but this is uh, reproduced in multiple studies. So, it is a very durable response for the dysphagia. So, the next one I want to talk about is called endoscopic submucosal dissection, uh, which is uh, like I was talking to you about the cartoon. I will go forward here a little bit, show you the end of it. So, they have created a space between the lesion and the, and the muscle wall and they are trying to remove this entire lesion. A lot of this is technical stuff, but I just want you to sh show you the end, the end picture of it, but how it looks. So, this is what they have removed. This person would have definitely required a, a colectomy if, he, if they had not done this procedure. So, this is almost a 10 centimeter long malignant polyp that they were able to remove. So, this is another video. This is something we done at our center. Uh, again, I will walk you through it. That is the lesion, which is cancer, invasive cancer. It is invasive only to the first layer. Uh, so, it is T1B. So, you cannot remove it with a snare. You have to do ESD because you do not want to cut through the cancer. Uh, that is what happens when you remove it with a snare. 
So, you are creating the space uh, by injecting blue fluid, making a remarking the lesion first. Again, I will go forward a little bit. Remember that it is also uh, a little tricky because it is so close to the pylorus. And once you make that space and then you cut around the lesion. And uh, now you see the blue staining of the muscle layer, and you're almost achieved near complete. And that's the last bit left there. And they're treating the blood vessel there, which is an artery in the bed of the base. And this is the end result of it. So you've removed uh, a cancer which would have otherwise required uh, antrectomy or a partial subtotal gastrectomy. Um, again, the big thing here is with ESD is probably one of the most complex procedures and training is very, very important. Uh, so, it is very important for us to understand what the learning curve is and that is what this slide, busy slide is about. But really, just focus on this one area here. As you can see, uh, successful uh, resection uh, really happened only in block 2 and block 3, which is after a whole year of doing ESD. So, it is almost important, very important that someone gets dedicated ESD training as a mentor at least for their first 100 cases uh, or else you are really going to not be able to successfully uh, start an ESD program. And this is what unfortunately turns off a lot of American medical centers from ESD. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the commercial aspects of these issues. As you can see again, uh, the learning curve, the speed really plateaus uh, after almost three years of doing this. So That is important to remember. So, what are the big issues? Uh, obviously, educating someone in non-traditional, right, uh, something that is a little different outside the comfort zone. So, you have to have a, a trainer who knows what he is talking about or knows what he is doing. So, that is the important. Uh, you do have to have a formal credential mechanism and a training mechanism in place, not only to keep your hospital and your department happy, but to keep the lawyers away from you. Um, so, we often do ex vivo models, meaning we have explants of stomach and esophagus and we do that. And then we do it in animal models. So, there is a very uh, good pig model that is commercially available that mimics uh, human anatomy very well. We use those models. We attend courses. We sit together with our colleagues and come up with uh, what is required for credentialing and such. Um, and mentoring and proctoring obviously. And we develop very strict standardized protocols and almost all of these procedures I start an IRB registry at the least. And if it is more experimental, I will actually have a IRB approval uh, for a new, new procedure or new device, which protects you and the institution from uh, problems. Uh, it is the, the clinical support from your department and from the health system and your university is key. Obviously, you can't do any of these without that and they have to buy into this uh, enterprise. Now, one of the big uh, obviously ancillary departments like surgery and IR are also important. But the biggest, biggest problem is this. There are no codes for these procedures, right? You are spending an hour doing some complex procedure or three hours removing a gastric cancer, uh, preventing a surgery which would have been maybe 35 RVUs and you get paid for an EGD. I can't build for anything more than an EGD with injection for an ESD, which is absurd in my mind. So, unfortunately, the insurance companies, Medicare are kind of behind the eight ball in this. Uh, so, a lot of it falls on institutions and hospitals and doctors to do this and I, I am not trained in doing that. And I had to kind of learn it on my own. So, you come up with a billing code, you come up with all the consumables you use, you talk to anesthesia, you talk to your surgeon, you come, come up with a comparable procedure and pull out an RVU unit and then you go negotiate with your insurance payers essentially. You take your managed care executive with you, sit down in front of them and say, hey, this is what we do, this is what it saves you, this is what the future is. You show them data and hope that they approve it. Um, some insurance companies are forward looking and they do approve these, some do not. They just deny it because they do not want to experiment. Uh, they do not want to pay for new things. Um, so, that is a big deal because you can't pay for this stuff if, if it is not paid for. If the insurance does not pay, you can't do it. I mean, the hospital may let you do a series of cases 
as an experimental protocol, but if it's consuming hundreds of thousands of dollars and we're not getting reimbursed for it, that's not going to happen. So that's the big, big thing. So these are very important issues that you probably have to work on all of these uh, for a good six months to a year or more before you put your first uh, procedure on for yourself. Uh, and I had to kind of learn it the, 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 uh, the long way because I was the one who brought some of these procedures to UAB and I didn't realize that doing something new or different uh, would be this challenging. So that's, one of, that's, a, that's a big deal. And, uh, you know, so the, one of the things we do is we uh, now have an established protocol for this. So we not only have like a protocol for how to get the payment part done, but we also have a protocol for how to get credentialing done, how the IRB does it. So we're able to actually help other academic institutions do these things too. Uh, we also get uh, fellows and faculty from other places to come watch us uh, and, and learn from us. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> yes, Dr. Miller. I just wondered if with some of the more complex procedures, you do these under general anesthesia or, or local, or how do you decide about that? So okay. I almost always, I mean, our anesthesia unit is extremely good. I mean, they work really well with, well, I take that back. They're not that good, but they're good. Um, because if he hears that, he'll say, yeah, you called me good. Uh, so the, the, way, the way we, we again, took a lot of trouble for me and my colleagues to make that happen. So in the past, we have uh, probably 80 MD anesthetists at, uh, at UAB and maybe 120 CRNAs. So we realized very quickly when we were doing this that a bunch of CRNAs don't want to do this. They don't like endoscopy. They want to do the neurosurgery where the guy's on cruise control and they're just dripping propofol in. So we asked our uh, anesthesia guys to, hey, just look at the, just pull them. Ask the guys who enjoy being with us. There's obviously guys who enjoy endoscopy. So we made sure that we got a pool of CRNAs who really want to come to us and work with us and enjoy endoscopy. Then we tried to reproduce that with the MD anesthesia group. It didn't work that well because we had 80 people. And, you know, the scheduling just doesn't. So we're not as successful with that, but we still get most, more times than not guys who know what endoscopy is. That's the first step. Now, after that, I noticed that when we communicate with them and engage them in what sedation is required, it's a very good one-on-one -on -one discussion. And sometimes you get pushback, but most of our general anesthesia cases went away. I mean, our general anesthesia for ERCP was about 50%. So we did 50% MAC and 50% general anesthesia when I first stepped into UAB. We're now at 95.5 or 90.10. If you're doing general anesthesia, that guy's like, you know, something's going on. They're obstructed or they're throwing up or they're very sick. Um, where we think uh, moderate sedation or, or MAC, monitored anesthesia care is not adequate. So, um, and if I have something that I'm doing that's really different, I really individualize it. I don't, I don't say these patients need to all get anesthesia. So I think that's the way to go in the future to really minimize uh, problems with general anesthesia, uh, you know, comorbidities of anesthesia. It's not a benign thing when you put a tube in someone's trachea. Uh, all you need to do is see one tracheomalacia or tracheal stenosis and you're, you know, scarred for life. So they work well with us. So obviously my big things are, am I going to put a lot of fluid into a contained space? Is the procedure going to be very, very long? Uh, are the two big things for me? And then the next big thing is patient characteristics. Uh, most of these procedures are all elective. I mean, these people are seen in clinic, talked to, and they come to see me, so it shouldn't be a surprise what kind of patient you're getting. So you should have a plan in place. Uh, but our, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't go with the preconceived notion, and I've really dragged our anesthesia kicking and screaming in that direction too. So they really work with us. They'll say, hey, uh, I saw this case, you're saying ESD, is the lesion really big, are you going to be two, three hours in? They'll say, yeah, it's going to be a long case. I'm going to inject a lot of fluid. Then they'll do a general anesthesia. Uh, so we do work with them. The biggest hiccup I've seen is deciding on whether it's in the endoscopy suite or the OR. Uh, and that usually has to do with cardiac comorbidities. I mean, for example, they have severe aortic stenosis or multivessel coronary artery disease that's not corrected, or they have 
hypertrophic, you know, significant hokum or something like that, then they want an art line, they want a cardiac anesthetist, and that sometimes really puts a spanner in our works. Because I book 14 cases, I'm doing two rooms, 10 in one, four in another one, and if I have to go to the OR, all that stops. I mean, it just freezes. So we like to avoid that. Um, that's been the biggest hiccup. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, John. Have you ruined any scopes with the glue? Was that? Have you ruined any scopes with the glue? <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, no, I'm lying. I did. Um, we have an old scope. I always hang on to all my old scopes, right? All the 140s. I have a cabinet, a museum cabinet full of my 140 scopes for that reason. Um, I, I did it in the beginning when I was you know, in a very hairy situation, like massive bleeding, and we had to get it done. And I was like, hey, hey, the scope's going to go, but I'm saving his life kind of a thing. Uh, but it does happen. Now, with a regular upper endoscope, and it's a 140 that's 15 years old, that's OK. They're not going to bother too much about it. So EUS scope, linear, brand new, $180,000, that's a whole new ball game. So I've developed very strict protocols about that. So I'll train my tech, I'll train my fellow, I'll train my nurse. I have the same people do it. We'll, if we haven't done one for a while, I'll do a dry run before that. Um, but really, the key thing is this. If you have a doubt that glue sticking out the tip of your instrument, just bring the whole scope out. That's the best. And cut it. That's the best way. But yeah, you can destroy. I think it happened once at me where they destroyed like an EUS scope with glue. So basically when we say glue, it's cyanoacrylate, which is super glue. Uh, if you've seen some YouTube videos or people doing this with super glue on their fingers, uh, it doesn't go away easily. So it can destroy the instruments you're using. So that's important to keep in mind. Yes, sir. Uh, you're doing so many procedures that general surgeons used to do in the past are any surgeons uh, interested in this and give me a training, or is it still primarily? Gotcha? So it's, it's interesting. Um, I think there's a little bit of a tug of war going on right now. A lot of the surgeons, especially the ones who do thoracic fellowship or gastrointestinal surgery fellowship, are interested in some of these procedures. Now, they're not as handy as we are with scopes, um, and they do understand that a certain degree of training is required because we do an entire fellowship. And you're working as faculty before you start doing these. And they don't do as much endoscopy, obviously. Um, so credentialing for them is an issue. And I worry about that because they don't agree with us often and on what's required for credentialing. Um, but yeah, there are surgeons who are interested in this. A lot of, uh, in fact, the POEM program was started really by the surgical group up in Seattle at Virginia Mason. They're the pioneers in it. But you know, it's a very, it's become a very collaborative experience. I mean, they don't say, oh, you're GI, we're not going to teach you or anything like that. It's, it's, it's become a little better than in the days past when people always fought for their turf. Um, it, it truly has to be a collaborative experience. You can't have your surgeons in the black when you do these things because you're going to call them if they have, if you have a complication. Just a random question. Is this the future of endoscopy? I think so. I think so. I think we're going to expand our indications more and more. For example, I mean, almost all gastric, you know, uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors that are five centimeters or less are now removed endoscopically in many big centers. They don't even go to surgery. Um, early gastric cancer, early colon cancer can all be removed through the scope. Um, I mean, I have a few more videos I can show you, but, you know, going to get become an endoscopy talk and you're like okay uh, stop but uh, but yes I think it is the future of endoscopy I mean there was a very interesting study this is actually from a colorectal surgery group that said that 25 percent of colectomy post colectomy for whatever reason pathology was adenomas it should not be an adenoma it should be colon cancer um, so even assuming that there are some really difficult adenomas that an endoscopist could not have removed even saying half of that 25% is a whole huge number of patients who could have gotten this done endoscopically instead of losing a big portion of their colon. Um, so I think it is the future. So 
All right, I have one more video before you get up because we have five minutes uh, that I can show you. If I can pull it up here real quick. Ah, <clears throat> uh, no. So I wanted to show you this. Um, it's uh, a video that shows you. Remember I was talking about third space? One of the third spaces is the lesser sac, posterior lesser sac. We do a lot of pancreas therapy. And I guess maybe I falsely assumed a lot of you might be familiar with these procedures. As you know, when you have severe pancreatitis, you can develop necrosis. Uh, and necrosis is a bad, bad prognostic predictor for outcomes in pancreatitis. The big problem is what do you do with this necrosis after some time after the patient, quote unquote, gets better from his acute problem, how do you get rid of it? There's not a natural way for the pancreas to come out of the GI tract. So it used to be we'd just hold their hand and, and keep them from dying. And sometimes if they got well enough, you'd do surgery. And necrosectomy, a surgical necrosectomy is easily one of the most morbid surgeries. So now we do this through the scope. Um, and it's a little, quote unquote, uh, gross appearing, but forgive me. So we have a big stent from the stomach into the necrosis, and I'm dragging all this necrosis out and extracting it. So we've actually healed close to like, even patients with 90% necrosis have uh, completely resolved their necrosis with just endoscopic therapy. Uh, so I'm basically going into the lesser scap, uh, sac with the scope and removing this uh, necrosis. Show you another video, and then that'll be the last one. So now I'm actually inside the necrosis with my endoscope, and I'm using a snare. That's the device that's coming out. I'm breaking all this really nasty stuff, which is basically dead pancreas that is infected. Um, and as you can see, when I remove, uh, the, you can open up pockets of pus. And often we use the uh, interventional radiology guys to kind of uh, help us out here. Because I really believe in gated drainage, meaning you uh, have the IR guys put a drain from the back into the pancreas bed. And then we put a stent through the stomach into the lesser sac. And then you create a little, like a circulating little uh, gastric acid uh, uh, circulation almost. So the acid goes into the stand, dissolves the necrosis, comes out the drain. And we see that when we do that dual drainage, the pancreas almost always, the necrosis gets better very, very quickly, uh, six months. Uh, and used to be that we couldn't do endoscopic therapy where the pancreas was uh, more than 30% necrosed, but now we're pushing our limits. I mean, we're going to like 90%. So then you'll put two drains, and then it's just time and plugging a at it and they get better. All right, thank so you. Question. Yes. I just want to say you, this is a, a wonderful presentation of some really interesting and amazing stuff. And thanks thank you, so sir. proud to have played some sort of role in your training. Absolutely. So I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you guys. So what happens on days when Alabama plays LSU. <laughs> you don't so, have to answer. You don't have to answer. No, they know I'm, I'm LSU. They absolutely know I'm always here.